history and the Department of Music with help in organizing the event. Uh, uh, let me introduce our speaker for today. Before I uh, knew her as Maya's mother, I knew Indra Vishwanathan Peterson as now Professor Emeritus of Asian Studies at Mount Holyoke College as an eminent scholar of South Asian Studies. In fact, Indra's talk was one of the first I attended as a graduate student in Seattle. It shattered my cherished assumptions about history. Historical work, I believe then, uh, as a fresh of the board student, was, a, was based on conversation among bureaucrats and dossiers prepared by the intelligence departments of the state. <laughs> Here was a scholar interested in some similar questions, which is, which is the charting of social relationships. But was studying relationships through drama, literature, epic, and music. Her scholarship spanned multiple fields, cultural history, religious studies, literature, music, and is based on her felicity with multiple languages, Sanskrit, Tamil, and Marathi, to name a few. She also has other uh, languages. Uh, all these fields are populated by some of the most fastidious scholars you'll find on this planet. Indra's work speaks to and is celebrated in all these fields. She has been the recipient of many prestigious fellowships, including the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for Humanities, American Institute of Indian Studies, and the Alexander Humboldt Foundation. Some of her important publications include Poems to Shiva, The Hymns of the Tamil Saints, Design and Rhetoric in a Sanskrit Court Epic, and Arjuna and the Hunter, her translation of the Sanskrit literary epic, Kirat Arjuna. Her talk today is based on a current work on the kingdom of Tanjore and its ruler, the polymath King Sarfoji II. Please join me in welcoming Indra Sanjore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can honestly say I have never received a more generous and welcoming introduction than that. If I can live up to the promise of that introduction, I should be uh, very lucky. So thank you very much, Junaid. And uh, since I, I am here as Maya's mother, first of all, I'm going to keep it very informal because I'm not being professorial. I'm just sharing some work which since her death, which shattered all of us, and then my husband's passing a year ago, it has been difficult to get back into this work. But I find that sharing it with people who are excited about this and want me to share it with them really makes a difference. And I do think it's really interesting work, I think, that uh, for all of us. So I hope you will find it that way, and I hope I can present it. So, as I said, I'm not going to read my papers. I have published at least uh, <coughs> two papers on this, one with the Madras Music Academy, an august institution where you don't get to present unless they think, you know, this is worthy of presentation. And they are also published in, in, in the journal. So it's, some of it is published work. Um, it is also, as Jermaine said, a chapter, or a small portion of a chapter, in my book that I'm writing on this polymathic king, Sarfoji of Tanjore. Uh, it was also known, obviously, in Indian languages as Tanjau, particularly in Tamil. But uh, it became Tanjore in the colonial period, and many Tanjaurians are perfectly happy calling it Tanjore, so it's perfectly all right to say that. Um, the book is um, titled uh, Tanjore Renaissance, uh, King Sarfoji, and uh, South Indian modernity. So I'm playing with the notion of a an early 19th century king, I'll be getting to him very shortly, the very beginning of the 18th, 19th century, who um, oversees this great flowering of culture in this very ancient uh, center of South Indian cultural flowering. My first book, Poems to Shiva, was situated in the Kaveri Delta, which is the area where it's, it's the big rice bowl of South India. You know about, you've done your history, river valley civilizations, and you know agriculturists and all that sort of thing, and it's very true of Tanjore. And Tanjore is seen and is celebrated as the foundational center of the modern, I call it the modern classical, put that in quotation marks, traditions of Carnatic music and Bharatanatyam dance. These are the emblematic 
a classical tradition sort of South India, but there a very long story uh, which I will spare you. The idea is that there was no distinction between classical and something else in the 19th century, and it was a 20th century process which created this notion of two traditions which are traditional. I actually talk about a Renaissance, and Renaissances are not necessarily or even primarily backward looking. They do look back to draw on tradition or their legacies and inheritances, but <laughs> they are primarily innovative and forward looking, and it's with such a moment I want to discuss here. So let me just start with uh, talking about the specifics of what I want to say here. Tanjore and the Kaveri Delta and Sarkoji's Quarterly Renaissance. Uh, and it would be best to read because uh, that way I can do it very quickly and just read these two paragraphs and then I will move on to the uh, specifics where I won't read at all. So um, Sarkoji, this, uh, um, okay, let me, I've, I've already said in my abstract, that even as, sorry, I should really say, among the new developments in the 19th century in the center was the advent of European music, along with the um, British colonial rule, sorry, in the 19th century. In late 18th and early 19th century Tanjore, even as key compositional forms, which we now use as classical critiques were developed, Carnatic music also absorbed European musical styles, European instruments such as the violin and the clarinet. Indeed, the violin became and remains the principal accompaniment in Carnatic concerts. It is a South Indian instrument. How did this transformation come about? Sarfoji, the polymythic Maratha king, and I'll explain Maratha in just a minute, who ruled the vastly reduced Tanjore principality under British supervision from 1798 to 1832 played a key role in these innovations. The Indian performing arts reached new heights of creative excellence in his court. At the same time, the king built on his European education, which was unusual for Indians at his time, to achieve a cosmopolitan synthesis of enlightenment ideas and Indian knowledge systems and European and Indian arts and cultural practices becoming a pioneer in South India's transition to modernity and an important figure in global interchange of ideas. The musical innovations you will see as we keep going, but I just uh, wanted to say a couple of things as a, a kind of a overview of what I'm going to say. At Sarfoji's court, <coughs> European music blossomed in conversation with the Indian arts. Sarfoji was the first Indian ruler to develop a full-fledged European wind band. Well in advance of Indian contemporaries, the king acquired knowledge of a very wide range of European music, including popular and classical chamber works for instruments and voice. He cultivated all of these kinds of music at his court, and he experimented with ensembles of European and Indian instruments, playing compositions in both systems, as well as in a hybrid European Indian style. The last point I will make in this paper, in this talk, along with discussing these innovations, is that 19th century Indian understandings of European music were shaped by British popular taste and Indian popular taste in its colonial habitats. Let me then you know, stop reading and elaborate on those points very quickly and summarize what I'm trying to say in this um, lecture. I, um, I had, please bear with me when I look for that one piece of paper where I wrote them down. <laughs> they are not, uh, because I didn't have one. Yes. This is the larger question. These are the larger questions I'm asking. Why do I want to tell this story of encounter? Let us separate the story of musical encounter from my book, which is about encounters of every kind in the arts, in the sciences, in, you know, um, uh, in uh, architecture and so on. Why this particular story? What does it tell us about music in colonial India? And in fact, we shouldn't even call it colonial India because this is the cusp of the entrenchment of colonial group. So maybe just about to be colonial India. Um, this encounter is, first of all, it happens in South India, a neglected, this is from the South Asian studies perspective, 
it is a neglected region with many interesting stories to tell, which are very much in contrast with other parts of India. Most research on Indian uh, uh, transition to modernities are uh, focused on Calcutta and the so-called Bengal Renaissance, which is a very vast uh, period of change where Indians encountered British at their capital, Calcutta, and it's a metropolitan narrative. What we are talking about, as you can see, is a provincial tiny kingdom. I'll show you a map in a minute in the case, Tanjore, in uh, the margins of empire and of oh, empire to be, because in 1799, just after Satoji supposedly came to power, he had to sign away his kingdom to the British and was his kingdom, this great rice bowl kingdom, was taken over by them and he was left with a fort and a city. It was from there that he conducted these experiments. So it's a very interesting moment. So Satoji is in some ways unique, um, but also South India is a polyglot cosmopolitan ecumene with the ever shifting balances of political power, a narrative that is obscured in current Tamil and South Indian nationalist narratives where all the states are divided into different languages and each state had a pristine and pure past going back to certain dynasties uh, and they elide all these intermediate histories. But the broader insights into how musical encounters are shaped by social and cultural forces uh, is what I'm interested in, of uncanny parallels and intersections in this case between widely disparate cultures and historic accidents and idiosyncrasies, happenstances and serendipities of these particular moments of encounter. And within that, this is an even more particular kind of encounter and we call it princely modernity. I'm taking a wonderful phrase that Manu Bhagavan, a historian invented. It's a wonderful phrase because the modernity is considered to be something that the Indian uh, elites who were English educated brought forth. But we find that the so-called princely state, and even at the end of the British Empire in 1947, there were more than 600 prince odd princely states left. These were the states with which, like Sephogis, the British had had negotiations and over, had overseen, but they had their own autonomy, particularly in cultural, culture, education, and other spheres. And Sephoji became a pa paradigm being one of the earliest people to do this, he becomes a paradigm for princely modernity. That is my point uh, about what, what is happening here. And lastly, uh, England, Europe, and India in the 18th and 19th centuries, you see that there really was no pure uh, classical music. Age, courtly, and popular culture were meshed and meshed in ways which I will show you in music as well as in other spheres, perhaps more so in music than perhaps anywhere else. And uh, when musical modernity is therefore something which is forged through these non-distinct kinds of encounters, there is of course the story of which instruments were adaptable and acceptable in Indian music from European music. But um, that's a very long story. It has been told by ethnomusicologists. I'm not one. We will just, uh, you know, we can talk about it with question hour. Okay. So, in order not to take up your too much of your time with uh, this kind of talk, let me move on. Okay. So here are the here's Tanjo, and this is a cultural map of. Um, is, do I have a pointer, or uh, do, is there a pointer here, or how do I? But I'm not very good with this. I'll, I'll bring one. Yeah, okay, one. yeah, it would be good. But in any case, you can I put a cross over there. That's Tanjore, South India, the Southern Peninsula. On the right hand side is a map of um, mid 18th century uh, South India. And you don't need to look at all the details. You can just see that Tanjore is way down south here. And if you look to uh, northwest of it, there's Mysore, which was the biggest enemy of the British and one of the last bastions of power. Many of these states were defeated by 1799, but many were not, as I said, many remain, but they were essentially under British supervision. Therefore, this map shows that Tanjore is literally a, a, no, a, a no place as far as the British are concerned. And, uh, and yet, in this map of culture, 
For millennia, it is seen as the greatest center. There's a little square here on this map because that is considered to be the great center of culture. Now, do I point it? Yeah. Press the bar. Uh, the bottom one? No. The, the, the block, the box. This one. This one, the, the light one. Okay. Sure. Oh, that, that's for a pointer. Okay. That's, yeah. okay. All right. Um, so South India is a multicultural cosmopolitan ecumenic. I won't, don't want to uh, point, stop at this. Uh, I don't want to, you to have to remember all the names except two, Nayaka and Maratha. The Nayakas and the Marathas were the early modern to 19th century rulers. They spoke very different languages. They were part of the second point I'm making here, which is migrant warriors. Muslim and European trading companies, missionaries, travelers, military alliances, tribal populations at the breakup of the Mughal Empire, all of this got even more turbulent. So South India is a churning uh, pot. Then the languages, which again, you need to know all of them, except the music involves all of these languages. Tamil, Sanskrit, Telugu, Sanskrit is the classical equivalent of Latin, right? Uh, liturgical as well as um, in every other way. Marathi, Hindustani, Persian, Arabic, Portuguese, French, English, and so on. The mingling of elite and popular cultural currents and themes is general, not just in music. And lastly, an emphasis on performing arts, which I have argued elsewhere, becomes almost necessary in a polyglot multicultural situation where communication uh, between various registers of culture have to be made explicit. Um, just a few visual images. The Pradeshwara Temple. Um, is this is this uh, going? Is this okay? I just want to keep track of time. The 11th century temple, the, one of the greatest first structural temples, and there's a rainbow over an irrigation canal. And Sarfoji, who wanted to be the greatest ruler of his time, excellence, leadership, distinction, innovation, and princely modernity were his credo. And the court is also a great participant in public culture in ways that they were not in prior centuries. And here's the temple. Here I am at the polyglot library called the Abode for Saraswati, goddess and muse of learning and arts with the manus palm leaf manuscripts here. But here is Saraswati herself, the logo of the library, and she's holding a veena, a musical instrument, which we were talking about. Manuscripts in various languages, folk figures in the palace audience hall. I'm going to rush through these because there's a lot to say. And a bird catcher couple uh, and a fortune teller woman from a tribal woman who becomes the central character of the most popular dance and musical dramas between the 18th and 19th centuries about, and they come up over and over again. And at least nine of them were written between the late 18th and mid 19th centuries in Tanjore alone. So uh, a German and English education for the Prince of Tanjore, missionary mentors, English networks, enlightenment knowledge systems, which I've already spoken about. I won't go into the long story, there was an adoption controversy which made it favorable for the British to give the boy, Serfoji, who was being oppressed by his rival candidate for the throne in the late 18th century, between 1793 and 5. And this became a seminal moment in his European understandings. He received a formal tutorial education for a year and a half, but he was mentored by a missionary who then became his second father. And this is the monument he ordered from John Flaxman, the most famous neoclassical sculpture in, uh, in uh, England. And this is possibly the first monument um, ordered by a private Indian individual to be brought over to India and placed in a church in Tanjore. His own statue was also made. Italian architecture, you see how he embraced all this. A 4,000 book library of European books, uh, and uh, including rare atlases and star charts and geography books and so on. A natural history album with notes by the king himself. Um, and here's a map where I've made all the things that he sent and brought by the court, which include um, things like uh, inference of Aesop's fables in Marathi, uh, enlightenment library, electrical machines, paintings, and personal. 
Now we get to art, music, and dance that Professor Stuart Castle is talking about. And I'm going to give you the very shortest glimpse of what people heard and what they played. This is temple music. <laughs> The veena, I don't want to linger here. The major treatises on the veena, the string instrument, the famous string instrument, a very ancient one, were written in Tanjore in the 18th and uh, 17th or 18th centuries in Sanskrit. So they're very prestigious. And therefore, in courtly culture, court virtuosi, court musicians, both male musicians and hereditary courtesans, were playing the veena and they were considered great maestros in this instrument. And these are later photos from different courts because we don't have any photographs from the 18th century in Tanjore. So I've just given you what is important is Tanjore Dhanam was the courtesan who moved to Madras and had salons there. And it was her descendant, Steve Alasas, with the T. Vishwanathan, who directly contained the famous Tanjore traditions. Three composers, the trinity of Carnatic music, Brahmins, independent, are seen here. Uh, in the hagiographical images. They wrote the major song types, which became popular here, a very zippy, very uh, memorizable uh, uh, and beautiful compositions, which became the anchor for the older music, which was raga music, and we'll get at that, uh, meaning elaborate raga music, which is still very important, but these compositions become important. Now, Badi Melu and Shivanandam, two of the Tanjore Quartet, were dance masters as well as composers. And the point I'm making is that the courtesan dance and courtesan music was inextricably intertwined with the virtuoso court music at that time. And that was completely stamped out by the 20th century for various reasons. Uh, Anjali <laughs> gets the expert on that. Modern Carnatic ensemble, ensemble, here's a photo, fashioned in Madras City in the 20th century. Voice at the center, mic everywhere, a drone instead of the tambura drone, katam for an electronic drone, katam pot, which is a very traditional instrument, and the violin, of course. And this transformation, which I won't uh, detail in any great uh, uh, detail, but ragas. Ragas are not scales. The emphasis on melody and rhythmic complexity is what makes them ragas. They are called scale types in European parlance, but they are not straight scales. They are a whole system. And if I can pull out, uh, there's a wonderful way in which Matthew Allen and T. Vishwanathan described what a raga is. And I'll just um, quickly quote that. Um, it's cute. What, what is a raga? Uh, at, it is at once a subtly delineated storehouse of remembered melodic history and a body of melodic potential to be drawn upon and realized in performance, a bit like a painter's box. Yes. And we can go on for hours, and I'm going to play you a snippet of maybe 10 seconds. So you just have to imagine what it's like. First, the elaboration, first, first the pretty composition, the zippy compositions that I talked about. So how do I just this? They they are playing almost in unison, but not quite. They don't rehearse together. It's like jamming. They come together. They each know the prithi and they play, and it's like echoing, right? Now, the raga alapana, the elaboration 
of a, a raga without any words, without any text, just uh, syllables. That is the most coveted kind of uh, improvisation because improvisation is the most important thing. Did I miss, uh, a, I, I wondered if I missed a slide about, no, here I am. Um, yes, this is important. Elaboration, improvisation, ornamentation of a particular uniquely individual raga, oral, oral pedagogy and transmission, all of these things are the hallmarks of music. Before the 20th century, I've always said, ragas and tunes cut across cultural registers. So now we will hear the elaboration without words. <laughs> So here you see rhythmic improvisation is happening as well. And um, my arrows here, too many arrows. Okay, very quickly. These are the important points. The violin was taken, adapted, adopted to show these very uh, complex ornaments and uh, glides and uh, microtones of South Indian ragas. Uh, and that is one of the reasons it succeeded so well is that it was very well suited to this kind of music. That's not the only reason, there are other reasons. And I just want to play a very small snippet of Katrina because that is an instrument which we are going to talk about in a very She's the best Maybe I can do the scale, except I can't do it at the pitch of these people because the instrument's pitch is different, my pitch is different. But let me do the two scales that I played just now. They're very easy to, to just show how uh, the progression goes. So the Thodi, the first one is. <laughs> But it sounds like this. So if you have a composition, so 
This is the second composition that I ever learned. It's called it Varnam, an etude. And uh, it is still one of my favorites. Wow. Because it's my favorite. <laughs> I told Anjali I'm so, so, so it's my like baby. I was seven years old when I learned this. <laughs> so good. Okay, so moving on. Uh, we want to get to the European music, and I should finish by three o'clock, right? So is this correct time? Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, we will, you know. Well, just now you have the, the basic lay of the land. Oh, I said I would sing one more thing, and I should sing this because you want to hear a folk thing. I specialize, this is the lecture you heard on these folk, folk fortune teller dramas. So you want to hear the distinction between this and the classical. <laughs> The Kuravanji fortune teller comes from the mountains and this is the song that she sings. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to unfortunately skip some of the other things because um, there won't be enough time. Maybe we can hear them. Okay, so how Tangerians perceive European music, because we're getting to that now. Notes devoid of grace and ornament. Sir Foji and his court musicians knew better because they were listening to Baroque and they were playing Baroque. And we will get to how he got into that because it was not easily available on the streets of Tanjore. He had to specially go somewhere to hear it. Only one scale, they think, European scale. It's called the major Western scale and it is equivalent to the Raga Shankara Bharana, they think. So all the compositions they write in the so-called European scale are in this South Indian raga, as you will hear in just a minute. Harmony, not melody. Completely different rhythm systems. Set compositions, very strict, no improvisation. Again, in the Baroque, this was not true. My colleague Bob Eisenstein, the founder of the Folger Consort, the Baroque uh, specialist, tells me that they did improvise, and even in Beethoven uh, uh, pieces were being improvised in the, in the 19th century, but that is not what Indians heard. So you go by what you hear. Uh, just as people thought that ragas were cacophony, <laughs> and they're not cacophony, we know that, but it's what you perceive. And the last and most important difference, learning through staff notation and sight reading, not oral, oral transmission. This is a moment when I can pause and say that Robert Eisenstein invited me to uh, invite Indian musicians to perform with the Folger Consort of Baroque Music at Washington DC in September of 2022 and perform three, concert, three performances of a concert which recreated or tried to recreate the spirit of Sir Foji's court. So it was called Music for the Last Raj. Uh, Carnatic and Baroque music at, uh, at the court of Tanjore. And uh, the thing that he told me was that they jammed for, because they're all superb musicians, they thought two days would be enough. But the, the thing that floored the older consort was, how can we do this music with no notation? <laughs> and the violinist is saying, that's easy. This is how we do it. You're a violinist. Do it. <laughs> and so it's really funny. Bob and Larry Schippel, the organist, uh, harpsichordist, which is tearing their hair. But the ultimate performance was absolutely marvelous. They were very good. A royal culture of courtly display. Why did Sir Foji need a band? Well, bands were everywhere. 
And um, among the European the military bands were everywhere. The British were giving troops, and the troops all had fight and drum corps, and so on. But Sephoji, of course, had these um, double reed and drum processions. But being a king and being a, the best king of all, he would have to have the latest, right? The most no the greatest novelty. But this was a very serious obsession for him. He, um, you know, there is the drum and five core when Sarfoji was still a contested adoptee. Um, that is his, uh, uh, yes, that is Sarfoji as a young boy, a young man. And there is his rival who was uh, tormenting him. Uh, here's Sarfoji in the height of his, uh, his reign when he's going on a procession, but I don't see too many instances of bands here. But these are his uh, European instruments, a sheet music book, and so forth. Here's a slow march that he himself composed, uh, learning the duration and European uh, uh, musicians. And here's a quick step that somebody, a friend, uh, a colleague, reconstructed from the staff notation. This was from a bad tune. So the novelty was this straight, these straight metronomic, you know, rhythms and these straight notes. But here was Dikshita, this Brahmin composer who wrote almost exclusively in Sanskrit about gods and goddesses. And then he hears on the streets of Madras the rakes of mallow played by fiddlers. And so he creates this song. I'm sorry, I lost my tune there because I don't really know this one. And here is the persistence of the band tune. which Bob, Bob and I and several other musicians did, I sang, uh, again, I need that Shruti. You cannot sing without the, the Shruti, which is the pitch background, because everybody pitches everything differently. Mm -hmm. So, Rimaka is a Rimaka, that any god of a sass, any the Pama, the Pama, the you see, it's supposed to sound like European music, and it does. Uh, compared to Thori Raga, which I sang, it sounds completely uh, Europeanized. Very hard to get rid of. Okay. <laughs> then, um, the violin permeated the musical scene in Tanjore. In the dance, uh, the, the, which processional dance of the courtesans, the violin began to be used instead of the sarangi, which it was a North Indian instrument which was used in Tanjore because of North and South cultures were mixing at this time. So you see the murdangam, double drum, and you see the violin and the cymbals. And then even the gods, there's the god Krishna, and there is Shivaji, son of Sarfoji, uh, who died in 1855 when the kingdom was annexed completely. Now here are the angel-like women, or maybe the courtesans. One of them is using the tambura drum, but the other is playing the uh, violin. So the violin became pretty much, but you notice that they're still walking, standing, and they haven't sat down yet, which is very interesting. Meanwhile, the Tamil Protestant Christian poet 
Tanjur Vedanayaka Shastri composed hundreds of Christian hymns in Tamil and always accompanied them with violin. And here are his descendants still playing and singing those hymns. Now you have CDs of his golden hits. And uh, Venus, so, so violins, the violin was very portable. It was amenable to the grace notes and other uh, aspects of his music. The veena was very courtly. This is, I think, an important point. It was courtly. You saw how they were sitting and the courtesans were playing and the virtuosi. Violins could be virtuosi, but you could walk around and play them. You could sit and play them. You could do them in concerts. You could do them in pop music. So that is why I think violins became so popular. Why it became the principal accompanying instrument is not something for me to argue because that has been brilliantly argued by Amanda Weidman, a former mm -hmm. scholar of South Indian music, where she talks about the peculiar notion of voice in Carnatic music as it developed in modernity, which was quite different from the notion of the relationship mm -hmm. between voice and self mm -hmm. and voice and instrument. And that is that dialogue that you hear between violin and voice in modern South India is very different from whatever was going on mm -hmm. prior to that. You should read her book, Singing the Classical, Voicing the modern, utterly brilliant. Um, Venus, violins, European airs, and sacred works in chamber music. Now, this is a whole other, this is Sarfoji's courtly privilege. Others, such as even the composer Dikshita, who lived in a village, couldn't go out, you know, and do listen to chamber music. They didn't have European connections. Sarfoji was overseen by these British officers. He was with the military officers, he was the civil officers, the political resident who was surveilling all his correspondence, and he was never allowed to go out of uh, his little kingdom. Mm -hmm. So he was always with the gentlemen and ladies in performances, at performances. Uh, so there are reports from the archives and from European visitors. The archives are the palace archives. I probably didn't tell you that Sarfoji, I forgot to tell you that Sarfoji ordered a way to England for band instruments as they were changing in Europe. Mm -hmm. The clarinet, for example, changed keys at least four times during Sarfoji's reign, and he had always the latest clarinets because you couldn't have a band which didn't have them. So every instrument, and there were in the library, music library, there are Gutteridge's manual for playing the eight key clarinet and things like that. So you could go there and learn all about pedagogy, about learning. And he had a staff of Eurasians and Europeans who were overseeing his own musicians in, in learning all these things. And they also learned staff notation because without that, they could not learn European music. So he was definitely doing that, and we will see that in just a minute. So let me uh, get the description, and here I won't have to fumble because I have a nice staple here. And let me get to the page where the European visitors describe what they heard at Sir Fauci's court. Mm -hmm. Yes, here are some descriptions. The Viscount Valencia, who visited early in the king's reign in 1804 wrote, hung up against the wall were several native musical instruments somewhat resembling a guitar, richly ornamented with diamonds and pearls. The Raja made one of his people play several tunes and amongst others, God Save the King and Marlbrook. In one corner was an English pedal harp, his favorite instrument. What uh, Valencia at that time didn't know that Sir Foji had a stable of harps and uh, a you know posse of pianos. <laughs> he had he had more instruments than anybody else. He bought them in auctions. He collected them from England and Europe. And they talk about the Maharaja culture in India as one of obsessive collection, but. I don't think that was all that was going on here. He was genuinely learning how to play these things and having others learn about them. So there is a very definite engagement here. Then two years later, the Reverend Claudius Buchanan, Vice Provost of Fort William College in Calcutta, a very uh, evangelizing person, was entertained with his, the purpose of visiting Tanjore was to see how could we evangelize all of India and why isn't the English East India Company not interested in doing this and why are they not Christianizing India? So he was very happy to come to Tanjore and see the Reverend Schwartz's, you know, uh, paintings everywhere and this group, he thought Christianized or at least European prince. So to continue this, he comes and he was entertained with the veena and the harp 
I don't know whether they were played separately or together, because we know several times they did play these mm -hmm. instruments together. He sent his band of music in the evening of 12 men, six performers on the veena, and six singers to the house of the resident where I dined. They sang and played God Save the King with variations in just measure, applying the Marathi words to Maharaja, their own most excellent prince. So what they're doing is they're forming a band of Venus, which is not a concept which existed before. Um, and later, on March 28, 1826, towards the end of Sir reign, court musicians performed in a chamber concert for Reginald Haber, Bishop of Calcutta, playing difficult classical pieces and sight reading an entire overture of a sacred oratorio by the Baroque composer Georg Friedrich Handel. In the evening, we had some excellent music at the residency. The bishop enjoyed it exceedingly and was particularly struck by the performance of two Brahmins who accompanied Mrs. Fife in several difficult pieces and afterwards played the overture in, for Samson by sight. This was what he, he said, these people didn't know this, but they're playing it. So this was the challenge. So Serfoji in the Baroque, how did Serfoji get to know about this? Handel's sacred and secular works were part of the rising nationalism of, uh, in Britain at the time. And this comes to a crescendo with the Napoleonic Wars in 1803 to 1815. But even before, rule Britannia, all these things. So almost every composition of Handel and many of the Baroque composers contained popular songs and certainly God Save the King, which we shall see in just a minute. Uh, so at St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George, Madras in January 1794, luckily a rare um, edition of the Madras Harkara, a short live newspaper is still available and it describes the young Prince of Tanjore sitting in the audience and listening to this concert. The church is very beautiful. I would recommend a visit. It's still what it was. Uh, he attended a choral concert, which consisted mainly of Handel airs and pieces, including airs from the Messiah, Samson, the occasional oratorio, and the coronation anthem. Lady Oakley, the governor's wife, was the principal soloist. I will not play the Hallelujah Chorus, you all know it. I've given this talk to Indian audiences, and that's why I have the clip there. Um, I will say, though, he authored highly popular oratorios, as well as the coronation anthem, with four anthems for George II, which we just heard, if you were listening, with a magnificent music at King Charles III's coronation. So Dr. Priest was, was uh, performed, uh, as was the much more familiar George, uh, much more familiar on version of God Save the King. So the so Dr. Priest is an older version of, of this. Handel was celebrated in commemorative festivals in England and in Calcutta, and he was the national composer. Prophetic vision strike mine eye, which is the aria from a secular oratorio, the occasional oratorio is what Sir Foji heard Helena Oakley sing. The text of it, Wars shall cease, and so on, is set to the tune of Rule Britannia, which was already part of an old, um, of, a, of a British uh, ancestry seeking kind of um, uh, uh, opera called Alfred, it's about King Alfred, right? So this nationalism is uh, completely you know, taking over. I don't think I have time to play too much of it or any of it, but what I'll do is I'll just have you here. <laughs> That's the point I'm making here. Then the chamber music in, at the time was airs for harpsichord, harp, violin, and piano forte. And uh, I think it was uh, Woodfield, Ian Woodfield has called it Corelli on the Ganges, and I call it Corelli and Handel on the Caveri, which was the very <laughs> <one. laughs> So, okay, Venus, harps, and piano forte. This story is really fun, and I can say it in one sentence. Harps were women's instruments. 
think Jane Austen novels, <laughs> and so were pianofortes, and they play a very important part in at least two or three of her novels. Um, uh, you can find out which ones they are, but they are among my favorites. Anyway, Henrietta Lady Clive, wife of the governor of Madras, visited Sir Foji. She hauled with her on elephant back a piano, and on another elephant, a hawk, wow. because she needed her da daughters to practice the two instruments. Little did she know that Sarvoji already had a collection of pianos. <laughs> he didn't in 1800, but she should have known. She didn't. Private music making in England and India was like this. Families got together, and these paintings were called conversation pieces. The women always played the keyboard, and the men played violin, cello, etc. And Samson was, uh, all of these oratorios of Handel had arias and airs, which were transcribed for these instruments. So Samson was not a public thing. It was a chamber music piece. And that is how Serfoji used it in his court. And um, that is what they did. They played it by sight. The Vena violin and sight reading became the new showpieces of the mm -hmm. Serfoji court, the culture of display. The court musicians played music by sight. They were also traditional Vena maestros. The Vena people were playing. And the court Brahmin Dharmaya, superintendent of the Tanjore court ensembles, ex, he was a Brahmin, expert Vena player and violinist, was a piano tuner, and he was in high demand all over South India because in that climate, pianos don't stay in tune. Venas, here are some Venas, let's quickly go through. Another reason the Vena was continued as the showpiece instrument was, apart from its beauty and tradition, uh, tradition alone wouldn't have done it. Europeans called it a great ancient instrument. Francis Falk wrote about it in the Asiatic Researches in 1788, and this was something Sefoji subscribed to. So if the Europeans are saying this is a great instrument, this is another point of excellence, and none other than Sir William Jones, the Chief Justice of Calcutta Supreme Court and India's greatest uh, uh, European Orientalist, wrote an entire thing on the musical modes of the Hindus and uh, cited the Veena as this excellent instrument. And that is why the virtuosi continued into the 20th century until, and they still do, and they still play solo, but they are not accompanying instruments. Um, God save the king, a very quick run through here. I've already said, we don't need to hear Malbrook. It's, it's the tune of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. Malbrook s'en va ta guerre, Malbrook s'en va ta guerre, Malbrook s'en va ta guerre. Nobody can deny it. <laughs> 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 God Save the King and Zadok, the priest I've already mentioned, were performed at King Charles's coronation. And uh, you may want to hear a tiny bit of Zadok, the priest, because. <laughs> Thomas Arne's version, which we all know. And I'm going to sing for you Dikshitar Sanskrit Notice Varam, Santatam Pahimam, which is to music, the goddess of music. So you can read the text as I sing. Santatam Pahimam Sangeeta Shamale Sarvadhale Chintita Tha Prabhe Chitru Pini Shive Shri Guru Guga Sedite Shiva Moha Kare So, subversion. God save the king for the Maratha king of Tanjore who doesn't even have a kingdom. God <laughs> save the king for the goddess of, uh, you know, South India. Uh, strange journey is this. I was rooting around in Sarfoji's music library when I found a, a book which said Rekta, or rather the title was Rekta, but when I turned it open, I found out that it was a piece, a book called The Oriental Miscellany, Heirs of Hindustan. Calcutta 1789. This is European women and men studying the courtesan songs of India called Rekta or Rekti, 
and transcribing them for harpsichord. It's the opposite of what was happening in Sarfoji's court and earlier. And this is something that lots of people have written about. They even had paintings made mm -hmm. in the Mughal style. It's quite beautiful. And they again were about fill the bowl and let's be joyous. The texts were all things like drinking songs, you know, just <laughs> like Marlbrook. And uh, uh, they, they recreated it, Catherine Schofield recreated it at uh, King's College London and uh, Sir Foji has a copy of this rare book and King's College bought it for some millions of pounds uh, recently. So this library is something quite remarkable. But the last thing I wanted to say was about popular dramas and popular operas and how they were the, that's in the air. Everybody was whistling and singing these tunes in India and in England. Not the Euro European tunes were being whistled in Europe. They were being played in Sarfoji's court. Indian dramas and their tunes were sung here, but the musicians and the king were comfortable with this idea because in their own culture, they were doing this. And uh, it's like the one I just sang, you know, that's part of this operatic tune. So the overture in Rosina, and a ballad opera, was completely made up of folk songs and marches and other popular tunes. And it was played in Covent Garden and the, and the King's Opera House. And these were the things that Britons were listening to. And the music was coming to India and being played by orchestras everywhere, chamber music everywhere. And the famous Scott song, Auld Lang Syne, attributed to Burns, was first heard in Rosina. The, that particular tune that we sing at New Year's, and we don't need to hear it. Light as Thistle Down is one of the most airy, airy songs, sort of like the tunes that were being sung in Tanjaul for their operas and, and musical things. And they were danced at the temple, and a whole uh, fortune teller drama, the tribal fortune teller, fortune teller's uh, song drama, was done for Sarfoji in his honor and was danced by the courtesans at the temple and at the court. And here is a, um, all the way into the 1930s, here's a film of the, the, the thing being performed. And then they were revived on the stage. Um, and here, um, and, the, and they end with a wonderful duet between her, a duet dance between her and her husband, who's a bird catcher, who comes searching for her. Now, if you're thinking, where have I heard this before? The Magic Flute, uh, Mozart. But these dramas were in India 100 years prior to Mozart. So what is this uncanny resemblance and where does it come from? I may not have time to play this because at three o'clock I'll stop, but if I play this, these are the last two clips I have. <laughs> This is sung in praise of Sarfoji, okay? The dance <laughs> Now here comes the Kuravanji, the fortune teller, and you can see her dance, which is quite different. <laughs> The choreography is in the lineage of the Tanjore Quartet, 
So the people who are performing it are doing it authentically. This is the uh, next two. Oh, I Papageno and Papagena. I won't play them because you can go and listen to them. Listen to Papagena's song, Papagena's song Der Vogelfänger, The Bird Catcher, which is almost identical to the theme of the song sung by the bird catcher in the Kuravanji drama in Tanjore. And then we also know that the final um, uh, duet of Papageno and Papagena uh, uh, is parallel. This is exactly like what happens in the Kuravanji drama. I just could not believe it. So the last thing is the Folger concert. I'm just showing you some pictures of what it looked like. And here, uh, uh, Jessica Bibi soprano and uh, Sruti Sarathi, uh, South Indian vocal, are improvising in each other's traditions. Shruti is doing Baroque vocalizing, and uh, uh, Jessica is doing Carnatic vocalizing. And the instrumentalists did the same thing, and they all played together, which would be even, they said, we want to go one step beyond Serfoji, and they managed to do it. And here's our grand finale with uh, the author being called. So thank you very much. That's all I want. So, questions. Sorry, I have to rush in here. Yes, I know. So, I, I was so um, I so enjoyed that, um, especially your singing. Like Janet, I've had the pleasure of learning and also listening to Indira's voice uh, from the time I was a graduate student. So, it is wonderful to have my here. I have a question which is more my yeah, own sure. ignorance, which is what happens to the flute? Very good question. And then the second question, which is connected to that, is again, my knowledge is abysmally bad no, very, very in terms of South India, yeah. but the Varnam, mm -hmm. which is the Tanjore Quartet Varnam, which as someone who studies Western India mm -hmm. and Devadasi stuff, follows through. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Varnam, which is for male composers, and the Varnam, which is danced by the Devadasis. Yeah, that, that one, yeah. that, that Hari, and Hari is the male dancer. Uh, they also had male dancers, but in that time they did not dance this particular exactly. kind of dance. So this is because it was in Maharashtra, it's more Rag Bhairavi, which becomes this. So I was curious. This is the South Indian Bhairavi. Exactly. So I could hear that. So I... yeah, absolutely. That's the way. I, what I, I guess my question is the yeah. flute was with yes. the Varnams in the, when they traveled to Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. They don't carry the the melange that you are invoking mm -hmm. between Europeans. So I wanted to to was they were they sanitized of that the exchange you know that you yeah, were speaking and, of and as they, they traveled or was it you know what happened? To yes, that? I'm, I I don't know enough about that. The dance experts should talk about that. You know, people like Devesh Soniji would know. Right, I have um, asked Devesh this question too. Did he know, know the, when they went yeah. to Baroda? You talk yes, about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now let us just talk about what these people were doing, these dancers. They were learning English. They were the only women who were allowed to learn languages, be educated, because they're like the geisha, right? They are courtesans. And they would play in public and other women were, you know, veiled and not doing anything or not allowed to. Women would be entertained by these courtesans, just as in North India, they would be entertained. Yeah, and in Mughal India, there are paintings of uh, women in the Zanana being entertained. Mm -hmm. That was true in Tanjore also. But these women learned English and, uh, and, and Persian, and they would do these Tawai songs, and they would uh, entertain European visitors with English dances. They would even dress in Western clothes. They would learn from the Western. And Devish Sonage's book, Unfinished, Gestures, Memory and Devadasi's Memory and Modernity in South India, a prize winning book. Again, um, I, I'm privileged to have Amanda Weidman and Devish Sonnetji as my very close colleagues and friends. I mean, I learned so much from these young people. It's just amazing. But the work that has been done is incredible. But to answer your question, the Varnam uh, that you saw, Varnam is that lyric piece. It's, uh, Hari calls it lyric memory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's remembering and then bringing out emotion, right? And it can go on for an hour or whatever. And they're still playing that in the repertoire on the stage now. 
uh, not courtesans, but other people are dancing. The um, one reason I didn't play that, that, that is still, I was going to say, the courtesan dance was, that history is so complex, I, I really can't talk about it. But one piece, and if I can get back to that slide, I can show you which I didn't play. And I'm just having trouble with this, with this whole, um, you know, this system of seeing sites that I <laughs> don't, um, yeah, hold on, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. I think this is a good way of going. I just have to learn this system because I'm so used to just doing the old fashioned. Okay, here, um, just listen to this. This is not a well known. It's not a Mm -hmm. They call it Desha Tony mm -hmm. also. <coughs> what? Oh. <laughs> but it's a man singing, right? This is the singer, but wait. The dancer will start singing now. chose to do a javali because Varnam's gone for an hour. Mm -hmm. And so the javali, this piece that she's doing, it's just sort of like North Indian music, a couple of lines just over and over again, hauntingly beautifully performed <coughs> by the vocalist, the singer, as she, the dancer as she sings. That became very popular in the urban setting of Madras. Mm -hmm. And those are the pieces that are performed by just about everybody. But the reason Hari and that uh, Sri Vidya were performing that Varnam was that they wanted to show what the repertoire of Sarkoji's sure. court would yeah. have been. And it was a, it was a piece uh, performed for him. That's about all I know. Why it was retained in the modern repertoire, I'm not <laughs> so sure, except that the Tanjore Quartet is said to have set that repertoire. Right. And just about everything that they set is considered <laughs> the foundation of classicism, and therefore it was retained. That could be one possible. So, what about the flute? Oh, yeah, the flute, right? Yes, the flute question is that the flute is still very much in uh, in presence. And what's interesting is that T. Vishwanathan, mm -hmm. these few people are the descendants of Veena Dhanam, the salon, uh, the great courtesan of Tanjore. Uh, uh, she was a musician primarily because by the time they came to the city, dance wasn't appreciated. There was no patronage. The royal courts were gone. This was an urban ticket, you know, buying micro microphone uh, charging kind of crowd. And uh, also they considered courtesans decadent and evil and immoral, and they completely abolished the Devadasi system. So anyway, so what happens here is that the flute becomes or remains the accompaniment to the dance repertoire even today even in a modern dance performance of this kind of stuff, flutes are used that way. Never or rarely in a vocal performance. There is a real, was a real gender difference here. The original court virtuosi, as you noticed, were either courtesans mm -hmm. or the male, you know, uh, Brahmins and other elite performers. When they came to Madras, it took a very long time before a non-courtesan woman could get on the stage and sing like MS Subalakshmi, but then how could you say she's a non-courtesan yeah, when yeah. all the singers, all of them came from the courtesan lineages and in between they had all acted in films or done gramophone recordings and that is how they, the recordings was what brought them to the stage. So very complex. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was wondering if Sir Fuji ever took his ensemble to Europe or did somebody invite them to the He was a court? prisoner in his own home. 
he could not go. The only time that big procession has showed in 1826, uh, not 1821, 22, he said he needed to make a holy pilgrimage to Banaras, Kashi in North India. By that time, the British had secured all their territories against the Marathas, who were very, very powerful in Western India, which is where this Maratha, oh, the, the Zoom is gone. I think I stepped on it. Is everything okay? No, it's fine. Oh, it's, it's okay. Yeah. So the um, Maratha kings, the Marathas came south from Western India, and that's how you get this. I told you about the migrations. And these Marathas ruled only for 150 years in Tanjore, brought the Marathi language, North Indian traditions, music, everything. And then Sarfoji brought European music too. This is why Tanjore was such a melting pot as well as an innovative place. But um, the question was, uh, Janine? No, there were actually two questions. So yeah, two was questions. the ensemble invited to Europe to some of the European courts? And yeah. did some Indian courts imitate his? Uh, yes, and that is the most important question that I didn't get into, but my book is all about that. He's the paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, and the most interesting uh, such imitations, not imitations, oh, but inspirations yeah. were Swati Tirunal of Travancore, and I showed an ivory violin that he had given to Sarfoji's court musician, Vadi Velu, who, by the way, the court musicians, once they learned all these things, they knew how to get out of there and pervade in other courts. And you know, it's like when you get a job offer, you can negotiate <laughs> with your, <laughs> your university. It's the same thing. These people would just say, okay, I'm out of here. I'm going to travel court because it's going to pay me more. And he's giving me an ivory violin. I have no idea whether the thing plays well or not, but it was ivory, so it's good. So he was so good as early as 1840. This was after Sarfoji's time, but nevertheless. So travel court, Swati Tirunal Maharaja, that state was heavily missionary controlled. And the missionaries made sure that Swa the young Swati Tirunal would learn all the European arts and sciences. And I'm sure he saw Sarfoji as the great you know, model. And he set up an observatory. You know, he, he also was a great composer. And I love his compositions. There's a big controversy as to whether uh, he really composed like Henry VIII or whether some of his court composers composed in his name. Uh, Sarfoji himself composed, this is the most fun uh, fortune teller drama of all, an astronomical and geographical Kuravanji uh, fortune teller drama to teach the children in the schools that he had set up in around 1806 in Marathi. And it's the dancer comes and she talks about her travels through the galaxies and the planets. And then she talks space, and then she talks about the geography of modern geography of the world and teaches the heliocentric system. So these kings were doing, as I said, progressive, wow. interesting things uh, without ever abandoning. Swati Tirunal did the, some of the best Karnata compositions. For example, he did a Tilana dance composition, which I will sing. Mm -hmm. and the, this is a dance, this is a dance piece. And he composed pieces of this kind in nine languages. He also, like Sarfoji, learned. Sarfoji knew nine languages. So did uh, Swati. It was good to be a polymath. So that's it. And the Mysore Maharaja, the band. The greatest band of India was the Mysore Maharaja's band uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, a hundred years after Sarfoji. That band was so famous that people came from all over India to hear it. And during the great processions of the nine day festival and the 10th day to the goddess, and the king would be riding on his elephant and this fantastic band would be going and he wrote band tunes also. So it was considered very nice to be doing all these things, but there's a little coda to that that in my day, when I was growing up, it was customary for the bridegroom in a South Indian wedding 
to get, sit in a car because they couldn't afford elephants and horses. So he would sit in a car and would be taken in procession as king for the day. And who would be accompanying him? The Corporation Band of Madras or the Tanjore Band. Uh, Everybody became kings of Fiji. Uh, on that day. <laughs> on that day, on his, on his wedding day, he became yeah, kings of Fiji. So this is why I'm writing a book about this king. Right. It's very interesting. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question about the attitudes about improvisation, because yes. on the one hand, I can imagine Europeans seeing it as not being trained, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's so clearly much more highly skilled. Oh, right. In order to do that, mm -hmm. were there any Europeans who recognized that? Yes, people like Sir William Jones. Mm -hmm. That's that's one reason, as I said. Then the culture of royal display, when you don't have any political power, you have to grab any kind of power that you can get, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the cultural realm, where Sarfoji saw himself as a as an impresario, as a leader, it was, and he was directly reading what Europeans, this is the ultimate self-reflexive king. He's he's got a whole library of everything the Europeans said about him, including Bishop Haber's narrative about visiting his court. This is the thing I love most of all. I talk about Sir Foji sitting in his library and reading the English newspapers and the London Herald and saying, oh, there's my name. You know, you want to be of global uh, renown. And yes, uh, they did recognize it. And then there were those women, Sophia Fawkes and Sophia Plowden, sorry, and there was the man Francis Fawkes in North India who transcribed these uh, beautiful partisan tunes like Taza da Taza and so on in, for harpsichord and staff notation. Unfortunately, of course, they ended up being drinking songs, but <laughs> or they were using the lyrics of drinking songs like raise the glass and let's be jolly. Uh, <laughs> let me go to so-and-so holly or whatever. But, but you notice how this kind of popular tune singing is common to both cultures. Mm -hmm. And that it's that serendipity, it's that happenstance mm -hmm. that I think made it possible for them to travel uh, across these cultural divides. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. So thank you for asking the question. Yeah. That was a good one. They were all good. Yes. So I mean, in some ways, this is this, this, this is Terry, the, right? This no. is Terry. Yeah, this, yes. is, so this, is the, this is the world of Dalrymple by Williams. Absolutely, yeah. it is. Only it's lacking all all the chapters that he's written, right? His his white moodles are really rather shabby compared to what you just exposed us to. Well, part of it, I think it's not, I, I, I mean, he works with primary sources. That he, I would not blame him of not, but often the archive is very heavily weighted towards European accounts. European accounts are known, but who goes to the archive and sees what Serfoji was doing? What was his courtiers doing? Or there is another divide, which is that we're studying performing arts and it has nothing to do with political or social or any other mm -hmm. uh, matters. And uh, European music, you know, it's just that it was there and some would even say, oh, he was so Europeanized, you know, we don't need to study him because he was so Europeanized. This was going on for a long time um, that, you know, Sarfoji was too much of a stooge of the Europeans and he was always consorting with them. Mm -hmm. But then later it became very chic to, to, you know, write English notes, even in the 21st, 21st century. And now everybody is calling me and asking me about, oh, you're working on this, you know, could I know more about what's, what was going on there? Because I would like to incorporate that in my concert, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a world, world historical note. So, it, so the other thing to say, because uh, uh, if, if you take your, Magic tornado, and you land in Istanbul, and then you land in Tehran, and then you land in wherever the main court is, right? You're going to find yourself in a similar cosmopolitan space Absolutely. in which all kinds of things are up to grabs that would later on be battened down, mm -hmm. uh, where there's all kinds of cross cultural cross minglings that are going mm -hmm. on, uh, in which multilingualism is the rule yes. of the day. There is no stable one language unless it, there might be a court language, but then there's immediately surrounded by other languages right. and other ways of doing right. so that so, so the 18th century has come back now in the last 20 30 years as a big major place because it used to be when when i was being trained when people were being trained to teach 
Middle Eastern history or Chinese history mm -hmm. or whatever it was, the 18th century was like nothing happened. Nothing. It yes, horrible. it was a blank Forget space. Forget about it. It was let's a wait place for the, the barbarians. Let's wait for the big boats to arrive with the guys with the beards, and then things will start happening. And for and us, it's colonial. It's this it. colonial history. You you know you can't do this because that's this it. isn't about us. It's about them. Uh, and I say no. It's about us. I mean, it's not us and them. It's about everybody. Yeah, and you right. should study what everybody was doing. And they were, as I said, the folk and the classical. They were right. not making those distinctions. Yeah, North amazing. and south. They were not making those distinctions. This very Sanskrit composer, this Brahmin with the veena, he was composing in Hindustani ragas, North Indian. He went to Banaras for six years, and I don't know about six years, but a long time. And he composed in, uh, you know. Shri Satya, that's very Hindustani style. Nara Yernam Upasma Nityam Shiva Pantuvarali. I don't know what the North Indian equivalent is, but it is a North Indian Rana. Sure. So, let, let me just say one more thing. Just, just sure. an observation. So, so, I always wondered. In, in, in my encounters with Maya, where does she get her amazing sense of joy? I think those of us who have been sitting here today have figured that out. <laughs> but you know, I would not take credit for that. The moment she was born, she came out with joy. Oh. And her father, my husband, Mark Peterson, was an embodiment of joy. He was the best person in the world. The two of them were twin souls. And it was my privilege to have them for 46 and 41 years of my life. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't, it isn't, because we've seen it. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, might give, we might give a different explanation. <laughs> no, I, I'm glad I but, but you know, kindred souls are drawn to each other. That is true. I mean, I knew that Mark and I were for each other. We knew. I shouldn't say I knew. We knew. And then Maya was part of our circle. She was born, and then two or three. And then, of course, at 18, she went into the world, and but she's always with us because she's part of the world, right? And that, that was the other thing. She loves the work I do because, loved the work I do because she enjoyed the spirit in which I did it. She appreciated it so much. And that's another thing I'm doing now. I'm doing this for her. And she would want me to do it. I'm doing it for Mark. He did the same, you know, he wrote a wonderful book on Galileo, very maverick book, which was immediately published by Harvard University Press because it was so unusual. I mean, we, we used to joke about it. We sleep with Serfoji and uh, Galileo, <laughs> except one of them is so well known that thousands of books have been written about him. And the other one is so unknown, if I say Serfoji, they say, who? <laughs> <laughs> so Maya used to laugh about that. And of course, she's, she's a, she was a remarkable, sweet person, as you know. But, but thank you for the pointing. And thank you for giving me that. Yes. I would like to know more about the, your name my, you my, yes. I would like to more know more about the results of the experiments in Sokoji's court. Yes. Were there composers who proceeded to compose in this a hybrid notated style with Europe and India? No, and wow. that's the interesting thing. The band continued. The, see, this, 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 this public, oh, oh, the notation. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, I'm wrong in the sense that I was thinking what they do in Baroque music. No, music changed. They too changed. But what they were doing was something else. And I'm glad you brought this up because notation became the biggest controversy of all. The question is, can can there be a notation for the beauties of, and that knows this well, for the graces and the gamakas and the jarus? How do you capture that in Western staff notation? So the challenge was, and there were these innovative people, let's develop a staff notation for our own music, ourselves. In between were experiments of using Western staff notation in a modified version. And they were all the two major ones. There were two major experiments in South India in the late, late 19th century. All these things were happening. In North India, as that will tell you, Surinda Mohan Tagore wrote, uh, he, he also wrote about the Veena. He even published Fawkes' uh, picture of the Veena in his book. Mm -hmm. They were all explaining Indian music to Westerners. And there was this question of translating it 
in the language of the West and showing that, like Sarfoji saying, our music is good. You know, if Sarfoji was doing something else, but they were saying our music is good and we can notate it in your staff notation, we've created something which will capture our music. And others argued and said, no, you can't do that. You can't capture it. Western notation won't do, we'll have to do something else. Certain intermediate notation systems have been devised. Now everybody studies through notation, South Indian notation. But I should also point out that already in the Nayaka period, which was a remarkable period of music, musicization, of music making, uh, they came from Central India, from Andhra, uh, and the Nayaka kings from the, the descendants of the Vijayanagar Empire in Central India, they had already sort of had inklings. They had written books on the Veena, and they were using certain kinds of notation. And there's older notation too, but no notation that we can read and sight read because we have no idea what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Sort of like uh, if you look at um, uh, medieval or pre-medieval music in Europe, and early music specialists are looking at that, and for the most part, they can read it, but there are some things that they simply cannot do. Thank you. That was, yeah. I think people are stirring, so should yeah. we end this? Yeah, and then you can have an informal conversation. Yes, that would be good. Yes, I don't know. Exactly. 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 Exactly.